Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. The deadlines are coming thick and fast, which means we have my Game Week 32 team selection just after Game Week 31 has ended. If you do enjoy today's video, please do smash that like button. And if you're new around here, make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So guys, before I show you my team for Game Week 31, viewer discretion is advised because there is some serious bench jam going on here and I know that will upset a lot of people. Let me know down below if you've got your own bench jam for Game Week 31. But before we look at the bench, I did get 68 points in Game Week 31, which was enough to take me from 75k to about 61, 62k. And that is now back to back pretty big green arrows after the wildcard. So looking at it all together, the wildcard has worked very well so far. And of course, it isn't just the two weeks after. It's the weeks before. It's the weeks after that as well. It's also when I get to play my free hit. So I can't judge the wildcard yet. But so far, it appears to have been very, very successful. But largely, the reason that I was so successful in Game Week 31 was a lot of bench jam. And I think the quicker people realize how much of FPL is down to luck, the easier. And I don't think some people say, like, how can you create content about a game that you say is all down to luck? It's obviously not all down to luck. You have to pitch the, pick the players that come off the bench for you for example you still have to pick a good starting 11 but after you pick the 15 players that you pick you need the FPL gods to be in your favor and you still need things to go your way you can pick the perfect team I've seen people with the most ridiculous teams for this week come away with a red arrow so FPL isn't easy and there is a large amount of luck and I think the the quicker we realize that the easier it is to let those bad weeks go it's just it's just some bad luck and when you get the good weeks you have to be willing to go the other way and say I got very lucky this week and it was funny because I was already starting to think about what I'd say in this video because Eight Nuri missed a humongous chance to get a second goal. Udogi missed a very good chance with the last kick of the game. Bradley absolutely dodged points for fun and got an own goal. Isaac had a massive chance with an open goal. There was no goalkeeper in the net. So I was already getting ready to go, oh, my team was a little bit unlucky this week. And then obviously I got the Garnacho 14 points. But FPL gives, FPL takes. And like I said, the outcome is largely uncontrollable. It is completely uncontrollable. But on this week, I was really, really happy with a lot of it. First thing, I chose Raya on my wildcard literally only for this week. It was a bit of a fearful thing. I just didn't want to have no Arsenal defensive cover for Game Week 31. But I'm delighted that it went well because if Raya had conceded, it would have been a pretty big waste of a spot on my wildcard and I could have just gone for someone like an Onana instead. So Raya keeping the clean sheet which shows that it was a pretty good choice to at least consider having some Arsenal defensive cover. The defenders... Despite two of them getting zero points, obviously Gusto getting booked and conceding a few goals and Bradley getting the own goal, I'm still really, really happy with the four attacking defenders I have in eight Nuri, Udogi, Bradley and Gusto. Because if you watch the four of them play, they had various chances to get attacking returns. But the star of the show was eight Nuri absolute monster of a player. I mean, he's playing left wing at the moment. And I will just note, and we'll discuss this in the next section, he's not going to continue to play at left wing forever. But as he is right now with good fixtures playing in an advanced role, he is getting multiple chances every single game to get attacking returns. And it's one of those where not that many people with my strategy would have picked eight Nuri because we get to free hit in 34 anyway. And obviously he doesn't have a double in 37. But I just fancied it as a pick because I was watching him in the highlights and some of the extended highlights too. And he was getting into the right positions. So it's one of those picks that just comes out really, really nice that not that many other people went for. Outside of that Palmer hat trick, I am crying inside as a Manchester United fan, being 3-2 up in the 98th minute and then coming away losing that game. Cole Palmer is just unbelievable. He's inevitable. Two penalties. He loves a good penalty. But even outside of that, he's just a remarkable footballer. It's a shame, really, for me, from a neutral perspective at least, that Palmer went to Chelsea and he's not playing at Man City because I can only imagine Palmer and Foden playing together at Man City this season would have been absolutely remarkable. But he is doing wonders for Chelsea. And a 20-pointer, I mean, I've jokingly tweeted at what point do we just consider permanently captaining Palmer. But with the fixtures that he's coming up, and he'll have a double-double in probably 36 and 37, there is a, just an argument to just say, just captain Palmer pretty much every week because he just keeps delivering. I think the big talking point was obviously Saka and Haaland not featuring. Saka looks like it was due to a bit of a knock, but hopefully he'll be available very, very soon. And I think Haaland just got a bit of a rest. But this is the, the risk you run with midweek football that we can just get these very uncertain outcomes where we don't expect certain things to happen. No one would have predicted both Saka and Haaland to miss out. And it meant that a lot of people got bench jam, me getting the 14 point from Garnacho, and a lot of people didn't. 
And I did not for a second expect that Garnacho would get anything close to what he did. I wouldn't have even predicted an assist, hence why he was on my bench. So that was very, very lucky. But as a United fan, having a Man United player on my team getting two goals was obviously brilliant. And I think there have been various points this season when I've not been as lucky. So I will absolutely take it when it comes my way. The only final thing to discuss was around Isaac. The man is just on fire at the moment. And again, he could have had two, three, four attacking returns in that game. I know he got the two penalties, which is very lucky. But outside of that, Isaac is looking very, very good in that Newcastle team. I guess also a quick shout out to Liverpool. To get eight points from Salah, Darwin and Bradley, including Salah Cap, is so disappointing. Bradley has been dodging attacking returns now the last two weeks. He's had so many opportunities. Getting the own, go own goal is, like I said, just an example of some bad luck. You just have to take that on the chin. Salah coming off pre-60 is interesting. Might that affect how we feel about him going into the Manchester United game? I doubt it really, but it's interesting that he didn't even make it to 60 minutes and then Darwin <laughs> getting that attacking return within like 20 minutes or whatever it was you're like you know what Darwin's finally gonna get a big score and he just didn't he actually dropped out of bonus right at the end I think Luis Diaz whipped in across he had a header off target and it dropped him out of bo bonus Diaz went into bonus and Darwin coming away with six points in a game like this is just Darwin summed up and I don't think for many of us Darwin will be in our teams for that much longer so that was the way it ended 68 points a bit of a chaotic explanation of how my game week went but that is how my brain's working at the moment let's now move on to how my team looks for game week 32. So guys before we move on to my team for game week 32 you will see at the end of the video that there is a five minute segment with a massive announcement about a job that I've actually taken as a football manager with a little twist if you do watch my content on a regular basis or you're just interested in what this job is there is a section at the end of the video I do just ask that you go and watch that it's not a normal sponsored segment or anything like that and just see what the announcement is because it'll be something that I'll talk about in the future on my YouTube channel and I am very very excited about it and my job actually starts this weekend so please do go, do go check that out and let me know what you think down below in the comments but for game week 32 I'm actually very very happy with the team once again but I, I always feel like it's always the opposite when you think you're gonna have a really good week you don't you think you're gonna have a bad week it's, it's always good and I just never know what's gonna happen with FPL my brain is absolutely fried with the outcomes in both directions at the moment but I do have two free transfers and I have 1.2 million in the bank so I'm feeling pretty flexible and I currently only have I say only because I normally have a lot more I only have two flag players at the moment and I think I only have one real big issue so I'm currently in a position where I could and this is a bit of a flex but I don't mean it to be I could burn the transfer but when I was sat there with Lascelles on the bench as you can already see that feels like a very easy transfer and I could conceivably see myself using the transfer elsewhere as well in the attack to set me up for the future too or if we get any injury updates on Friday because I'm recording this late on Thursday evening. So, with all of that being said, the team is currently rated at 93% according to Fantasy Football Hub, and I'm projected to get 65.9 points, which is slightly less than I was in game week 31. Starting with the goalkeeper situation, actually one of the more difficult decisions for me this week, I've got Petrovic against Sheffield United, or I've got Raya against Brighton. Now, on paper, you just go Petrovic, right? You're playing against one of the worst teams in the league, and Chelsea's defensive data underlying-wise isn't awful. They're not a great defence, but they're not one of the worst. And Petrovic will probably make saves regardless. But Arsenal are just so good. And I, I still don't think I can fully wrap my head around how good Arsenal are. And I'm pretty sure most people can't. They are one of the best defences we've ever seen in the Premier League. The, the way that they limit the opposition to the amount of chances they get is remarkable. And actually, Brighton have been attacking very poorly recently. They've shored up at the back, but they've lost a lot of their creative spark and their ability to score goals. So I'm looking at this and thinking, actually, Raya may well be the better one to start, especially as I already have Gusto as well, assuming that Gusto does start against Sheffield United. Because obviously he came off again in game week 31. He was nursing an injury before that. So assuming we think he'll play, start and get 60, I'm already sort of covering the Chelsea clean sheet there. And while that's not, whilst that's not always the best way to look at it, maybe I do just diversify and hedge my bets a little bit. So I would love to know down below, and I'm going to ask you about a few key decisions today. Petrovic versus Raya. Who would you start if this was your team? At the moment, I'm just about giving Petrovic the nod because I think if Arsenal do concede, most other people that play FPL will have at least one Arsenal defender. So it may actually put me ahead. So I may be slightly willing to risk it. As I said, I do have Gusto. He's currently still flagged in FPL at the time of me recording, but I've removed his flag because he played and I, I think he should be fine for game week 32 as long as he didn't re-aggravate the injury. It may well be that he gets a bit of a rest here though, especially after how taxing that game was against Manchester United for pretty much everyone involved there. Maybe Gusto does get a rest, but 
I think he'll start if he's available because he's very, very important. That right side between Palmer and Gusto, as bad as Chelsea have been at points this season, that is a bright spark. I mean, they are one of the best right-hand pairs in the Premier League, maybe alongside the likes of Ben White and Bakayo Saka. I'm not going to say who's better, but Gusto and Palmer, they just link up so very well. So I think Gusto will start if he's available. So Gusto and Petrovic against Sheffield United away could potentially be double clean sheet, if not a hope for some saves and attacking returns. So they will be starting for me at the moment. I do have a bit of a benching headache, not only with the goalkeepers, but a bit with my defence as well. I've got Udogi, Aitnuri and Bradley, and I have to start two of them and bench one. I've obviously got Lascelles on the bench too, and I'll discuss in a second possible replacements for him. I'm currently backing like the better fixtures on paper and also the two defenders playing at home. So I have Udogi and Aitnuri at the moment. Udogi's actually been very attacking recently and his data has been okay. And as I said, in game week 31, he had a chance right at the end of the game and it fell to him just inside the box. And I was thinking, this is it. He's going to get his attacking return. And he sort of scuffed it a little bit. It wasn't a fantastic attempt, but he is still popping up in the right areas. And whilst I do think Aitnuri and Bradley are probably more attacking than Udogi, if I was to bench the least attacking, it would be Udogi out of the four. I kind of like the potential for a clean sheet the fact that he's playing at home and I do think he is due a return at some point I think he's been getting into the right positions quite a lot so I, I still like you doggy but maybe on paper if we're going based on hall potential you doggy's maybe the one with slightly less attacking threat maybe I'm building a bit of a narrative here eight Nuri I'm going to start because he's playing on the left wing so I think I've pretty much committed to that unless we get news that we think he'll be starting at left back or left wing back a little bit deeper then maybe I've got the potential to bench him and if we're looking at clean sheet potential with the way that Wolves defend, especially at home, maybe this isn't the best chance for a clean sheet. Wolves are actually much better defensively away from home. West Ham have been attacking fairly well. So I don't look at this and think clean sheet for Aitnuri. I'd look at it as I did with 31 and think maybe the potential for an attacking return. So I do think I want to start Aitnuri, but then I've got Bradley on the bench against Manchester United. Man United are shipping goals for fun. There are so many defensive injuries. Varane went off injured. Lissandro Martez is injured. Lindelof's injured. Evans then came on for halftime came on at halftime and then went off injured. Manchester United, Wan Bissaka was picking up injuries and knocks throughout the game. It's just an absolute state at the back. And even with all fully fit defenders, Manchester United can't defend. We are one of the worst defenders defences in the league. So unless Trent is magically back for this Manchester United game, which doesn't look to be the case, Bradley should start. And therefore, I'm looking at this, even if United score, Bradley's going to have some serious chance for attacking returns. So whilst I didn't think I had a benching headache, when I was looking at this before, I was like, bench Bradley, Trent may even be back. I'm looking at this now and thinking, can I bench Bradley against Man United? And I, I, I'm starting to think I can't, especially after watching that Man United-Chelsea game and after watching Bradley against Sheffield United too. So I think the way that I'm currently viewing this is I do prefer Petrovic to Raya. I want to start Gusto and Aitnuri. So I actually think it's you, Doggy or Bradley for me. But I would love to know down below, of my four defenders currently, ignoring Lascelles, who is the one that you would bench? Just on Lascelles, in the final section, once we've looked at my team, I'll show you my watch list. I'm currently considering four defenders for Lascelles. I do have a favoured two that I'm currently deciding between, but I'll discuss that when we move on to my watch list. But one of my two free transfers will definitely be selling Lascelles this week. I won't burn a transfer, and I can't see any other pressing issues to deal with. And given that Lascelles is out for six to nine months, I see no issue with just selling him this week. So those four defenders, very, very happy with. Lascelles will be sold. Let's now move on to the midfield four. Recency bias? Who, who said recency bias? I don't even know what recency bias is. But anyway, Cole Palmer is my captain for game week 32. Uh, I, I did change this after the Manchester United show. Listen, I am into psychology. I know about all of the psychological biases. It doesn't mean that I don't experience them myself. And I just sat there and watched Cole Palmer rip my team a new one and score a hat trick. I will just say, if you removed the two penalties, which is a silly thing to say because he got them and he scored them and he, he's a brilliant penalty taker. If you remove them, and Cole Palmer just got the one return, would my armband be on Cole Palmer? Maybe. I do still think, even ignoring what we saw against Manchester United, Cole Palmer against Sheffield United could potentially be the best captaincy option. But I do think there are some seriously good other options. I think Son and Salah deserve consideration. We'll discuss in a second. I, I even think Erling Haaland deserves some consideration too, despite the fact that Man City have struggled against Palace in the past, and the fact that he's a forward, I prefer to captain midfielders. I still think Haaland deserves some consideration. So I think there are various good captaincy options this week. But at the moment, I do have it on Palmer for a couple of reasons. Super consistent. He often gets multiple returns in a game. And this is something to consider, right? I think the, the term sort of double digit hauls is a bit silly because if someone scored nine or 10, there's not that much between them. But to, to discuss the idea that Palmer gets multiple returns in a game, I think that is important because you don't want players that can only get you a single goal. 
You want players that can get you two, three returns. And Palmer has done that on more occasions than any other player this season. So that I love. On penalties, I love. 90 minutes pretty much every game I love. And he is playing against Sheffield United. So, and actually Chelsea have been better away for large spells of this season too. A lot is pointing to just this being a really good fixture for Cole Palmer. But as I said, I think there are some other good options. Son is the only one with a home game this season, uh, this season, this game week, out of all of the popular captaincy options. I prefer captaining players at home. Most of these players, in fact, I think all of the captaincy options are better at home as well. So if preferable, I would like to captain a player playing at home. Son is also good for minutes. Son is also on penalties himself, and he's an ex excellent, exceptional finisher. And he himself has shown at various points this season that he can get multiple returns in a game. So Son deserves consideration. Salah against Manchester United. He loves playing against Manchester United. And we just saw Man United ship four goals to Chelsea. Could Liverpool put five, six goals past them? Sadly, yes, they could. So I, I definitely don't overlook Sal Salah this week. And to be honest, before tonight, my armband has been on Salah. But that's just due to me being a United fan, knowing what Salah does to us every time he plays us. Apart from obviously earlier in the season. But Salah just has this ability to just turn it on against Manchester United. Especially at Old Trafford, he seems to love it. So Salah deserves consideration. And then, like I said, Haaland's a great option too. The only one that I'm not considering is Bukayo Saka because Brighton have been pretty good defensively. Saka is very bad away from home, at least underlying data-wise. And also, he's a bit of a doubt as well. So, captaincy, I could see it being on any of the four of Parmesan, Salah, or Haaland. Just on the Saka, based on the updates that we've had, it looks like it was a bit of a rest slash he is carrying a bit of a problem. But I think he's been carrying problems all season. So I think it was more of a rest. If it was more of a difficult game, and this is no, I don't want to discredit Luton as a team, but I think if it was Brighton and then Luton, I think what we would have seen is Saka play against Brighton and then get rested against Luton. I don't think it was due to it. I don't think he needed the rest necessarily midweek. I think it was to do with also the fixture that Arteta just felt that his team could beat Luton without Saka there. So I still think, and it's only my interpretation, that Saka will be available for the Brighton game. If we get an update on Friday or going into Saturday that he's not or that he's a serious doubt, Saka to Foden is sat there for me, right? I need to bench boost in 37. Foden's got some nice fixtures coming up. Luton at home in 33. And it will save me some funds as well to then spread across my team if I want to upgrade my bench a little bit. So Saka to Foden will probably happen for me if we get a negative update on him. But I think that is also a bit of recency bias. And also Saka, I just think, is a brilliant option for the next two game weeks if he's fit and available. We just saw what City did to Villa at home. He's got Villa at home in 33. He's got Bournemouth in 36 too. Spurs in 35 isn't even bad. Remember, I'm free hitting in 34, so I don't need to think about 34. But Saka does feel like a nice option to keep. So I would only move him to Foden if we had confirmation that he was out. And even then, I could just play Garnacho. We saw what he just did against Chelsea. I do think that that was very lucky for me, though. And I don't think Garnacho is a good option to start in 31 or in 32. And I would preferably not like to start Garnacho against Liverpool at home. So there's the midfield. The current plan is to just leave it as it is. Decide on captaincy. And then if Saka is out, I can remove him to Foden, but I think he'll be available. I would love to know down below. I'll probably discuss it in more detail in the deadline decisions video, which will be out later today on Friday afternoon. Let's say about 4 or 5 p.m. UK time. Who are you currently looking to captain out of all of the popular options? And is anyone going a little bit differential? So guys, moving on to the three forwards, I have Haaland, Isaac, and Darwin. And to be honest, most of my team are playing away from home this week. And that's because in 30 and 31, most of them were playing at home. And I don't really like seeing all of these away fixtures. In general, it makes me think my team's going to do pretty poorly. And of course, that's not always the way it works out. But all three forwards playing away. Haaland, as I said, deserves consideration. He got a complete rest midweek. But this doesn't feel like a great game for him. We know Haaland is better at home. And I actually think Crystal Palace, for large spells this season, have defended fairly well. And the underlying data supports that as well. At points, we've said like, oh, Palace have got loads of injuries. We should target them. But generally, they don't seem to ship that many goals. And maybe this is a bit of narrative bias again, but City have struggled against Palace. And not only last season, but the season before that as well. There have been various occasions where Palace seem to just know how to defend. Bit of a bogey team for Man City. Maybe I don't buy into that that much. And I think City will still score two, three, four goals here. But I don't think Haaland is a standout captain this week. But he's definitely up there in the top four and he deserves some consideration for sure. And he, he's up there for me as well. And I'll be deciding whether it's captain him. I don't feel the need to sell him. But obviously, so far on my wild card, he's got me two and then zero. And if you do sell Haaland, you free up a lot of funds. But I'm looking at game week 33. I'm going to captain him against Luton at home, regardless of what happens in 32. So Haaland stays for me and is still worthy of consideration for the captaincy. Isaac, I love. 
I do think he's better at home. Again, we know Newcastle are better at home and Fulham are better at home. So I don't look at this as a particularly good fixture. But then again, I looked at the fixture in game week 31 without Gordon against a pretty okay Everton defence and I didn't expect anything either. And he should have realistically come away with two goals there because he missed a huge chance. So I love Isaac on penalties. The thing that I love, and I spoke about this in 31, on Isaac more than anything at the moment, is he looks very, very fit. He's running until the last minute. He's getting 90 minutes back to back to back. He got two lots of 90 minutes in the international break too. He just looks incredible at the moment. And the biggest thing with Isaac, no one doubts his talent. No one doubts his goal scoring abilities. His underlying data is stupid. It's like up there with Darwin and Haaland. But he's also a very clinical finisher. All we've ever questioned really is whether he could stay fit for Newcastle. So I'm loving having Isaac. And the thing that I love most is most people that aren't free hitting in 34 still can't move for him. And the next two games against Fulham and Spurs, I still see opportunities for him. So hopefully he can continue to return. But by game week 35, when they have Sheffield United and Burnley and the double, everyone's going to have Isaac in their team, I'd imagine. So very happy with him for the time being, but not necessarily expecting too much against Fulham. And then finishing with Darwin, there is a world in which I sell Darwin this week. My issue is the two options that I'm looking at, as I'll discuss in the next section, is probably Cunha and Hoyland for my long-term strategy. Cunha still hasn't started a game since coming back from injury and Hoyland's got Liverpool. So this doesn't really feel like the week for me to make the Darwin switch. So I think more, more likely for me is around 35 or 36 that I make the Darwin switch because if, and then next week he plays Crystal Palace at home. And we know again, Liverpool are much stronger at Anfield. So I, 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 I like Darwin. I love Darwin as a player and as an FPL option, but I, I'm not stuck to him as I used to be. If I see an opportunity to sell him and a player comes in for me and they have a good fixture in that week, I am happy to sell Darwin now. He just doesn't seem to be able to get multiple attacking returns in a given game. We spoke about how good Palmer is for that reason. Even when Darwin plays well and gets lots of chances, he gets like five, six, seven points. And because he misses so many chances, he's not particularly good for bonus either. So Darwin against Man United is absolutely fine. I'm expecting him to get chances, but I'm also not against the idea of selling him in the coming weeks. Some people will be worried about whether Darwin starts because obviously he played 90 minutes again in the league against Sheffield United. And is there a question of whether he starts against United? I still think this is a big game for Klopp and an important game too. And whilst Manchester United could potentially just roll over and it could be easy, I think he'll want to start with his best 11 here. And I think especially after given how difficult the Sheffield United game was for them, I don't see him mass rotating against Manchester United. So whilst Gakpo is fully fit, rested and available to play that spot, I still think it'll be Salah, Darwin and Diaz would be my prediction. But then we do have Jota coming back soon as well. But I think for the United game, I could be wrong. I think Darwin will still start this game given how important it is to Liverpool's title hopes. So that's, that's my front three. I'm still pretty happy with them. No need to sell any of them for the time being. So just to recap my starting 11... It's in a really, really strong position, mostly away from home, which obviously isn't ideal. But I don't have any glaring issues other than if Saka is a doubt. But even so, then I do have the option of just relying on my bench of Garnacho or Bradley. I could switch them around on the bench. The only key decisions for me to make are, do I start Petrovic or Raya? Let me know down below what you think. Which of my four starting defenders or my four fit defenders would you bench? Again, let me know down below. And then finally, who do I bring in to replace Lascelles this week with one of my two free transfers? So with all of that in, my, in mind, let's now take a look at my watch list for Game Week 32. So guys, now that you've seen my team for Game Week 32, here is my current watch list. Very briefly on the midfielders and the forwards, as you can see, I am on free hit 34, bench boost 37. So Gordon Foden, Cunha, Hoyland, those are the four that I'm considering. Three of them double in 37. Cunha's the only one that doesn't, but he's got really nice fixtures in the lead up. He's actually got Luton at home in 35. In 36, I don't need him. I think he's got City in that week or a fixture like that, and I wouldn't need him anyway. And then in 37, he's got Crystal Palace at home. And yes, I'm bench boosting, but if I had to bench boost Cunha against Palace at home, if he's fit on penalties at that point, he could be a really good option. We don't know that he'll be on pens, by the way. Could be Sarabia, could be Cunha, could be Huang, whoever's available at that point. We don't yet know, but I still think he's a really good option and he's very, very cheap. So those are the three that I'm considering. I Sorry, the four that I'm considering. I don't really feel the need to bring any of them in now. But if any of my midfielders were a doubt, I think I would favour Foden. But I do still really like Gordon. Again, for the cheap price and the fixtures that Newcastle have. And then in the forward spot, I probably am still just about leaning Hoyland. But given how bad Manchester United are and given how cheap Cunha is... And the fixtures, I mean, the fixtures from 35 onwards are pretty good for Man United, especially that game against Burnley at home. But Cunha's got Luton at home. I wouldn't be surprised if I end up going for Cunha or another player potentially that might arise. Even a Jao Pedro, not on here right now, because 
I just am wary with the Zerbi and Jao Pedro, but could become an option if he starts consecutive games. So those are the midfielders and the forwards. But as I said, I, I don't really need to make a transfer this week unless anyone is a serious doubt. So really, I'm looking at the defender spot. And for Lascelles, I've got up to 5.1 million to replace him because he's 3.9 and I've got 1.2 in the bank. So the four players that I'm currently considering are Branthwaite, Van Heck, Maguire and Gvardiol. On Branthwaite, similar situation to Cunha. I think he's got Brentford at home in 35. In 36, I don't need him, but he's, I think they've got Luton. This is all off the top of my head. I should have prepared more, but I think it's Luton away in 36. And then in 37, he's got Sheffield United at home. So in that spell after the free hit 34, Branthwaite would serve me really well. And again, could I see Branthwaite against Sheffield United at home outscoring Van Heck with a pretty difficult double? Absolutely, I could. Again, single game players all the time outscore doublers, especially with fixtures like that. So I'm certainly not ruling out going for Branthwaite, despite him being the only player here that doesn't double in 37. But if I do want a player that does double in 37, I still think I've got some really good options in Van Heck, Maguire and Gvardiol. They've all got their issues associated with them, right? But I think Van Heck probably is leading the race for me at the moment. Given that Brighton are defending very well, in the weeks that I need him, he's actually got some pretty decent fixtures too. Whereas Branthwaite doesn't actually rotate perfectly with my team, especially in 33, I need a defender. Branthwaite's got Chelsea, which isn't ideal. So Van Heck actually rotates into my team a little bit better. And he does double in 37. And like I said, Brighton have been defending well. And he's actually carried a little bit of attacking threat. Surprisingly, I was slightly surprised when I looked at his data it's not like he carries no attacking threat so whilst it feels a very simple and obvious transfer van heck i think it kind of serves the purpose of what i need from that defender i don't need them to be a game breaker i've got enough attacking defenders that i can start in most other weeks i just need a defender that will serve me well when i need to rely on them so van heck's probably top of the list for me at the moment Maguire, i think now has to start probably for the remainder of the season just the amount of injuries that Manchester United have. I can't see a point in which we have two other centre-backs and defenders alongside Maguire. I do think that Manchester United's preferred back line would be Varane and Martinez. And, and therefore, I think if both of them are fit, then Maguire's an issue. Varane just can't stay fit at the moment. And it looks like the Sandra will be out for a minimum of sort of two to three weeks, could be even longer. So the likelihood of them both being fit at the same point and both being fit enough to start and the likelihood of Maguire dropping enough stinkers that he comes out of the starting 11, I just don't think all of those things are very likely to happen. So I think you would probably get away with having Maguire right up until the end of the season, but you just can't confirm that. I do think there is a world in which Varane somehow manages to string some games together and Lissandra Martinez comes back before 37 and then you're maybe stuck with a defender that isn't going to play both in that double. So I think you'll get away with it, but is it a risk worth taking given how bad United are? 16th or 17th now for expected goals conceded per 90 this season. Just not a good defence. And Maguire really hasn't even shown much attacking threat in recent months as well. So for me, it's just not worth the risk when you've got the likes of Branthwaite and Van Heck sitting there, who are very, very nailed from what we've seen, especially Branthwaite, not going to miss a single minute. Van Heck, I think, is pretty much fully nailed. And I think arguably even have better fixtures at points too. And are playing for better defences. As crazy as it is to say, Everton and Brighton are just better defences. So for me, Maguire is just probably not worth the risk. I'd rather, if I was going to go for a United defender, go for Dallow with some more attacking threat or realistically Onana, who makes a hell of a lot of saves. I feel like that's a better investment for me, which just leaves Gvardiol, who's been very, very attacking. I had the chance. He created a brilliant chance, by the way, in game at 31. Could have come over the assist. I can't remember who it was for. Maybe like Jack Grealish and they hit the post. So Gvardi always definitely more attacking than he has been at points this season. And he looks pretty nailed given the injuries that City currently have and the fact that he is playing incredibly well. But in a similar way to Maguire, can I confirm to you right now that he plays both in 37? No. Can I even confirm to you that he plays, for example, the Luton at home game in 33? No, because it's Miss Man City. I remember when I bought Ake because Ake was fully nailed in double game at 25 and he just missed one of the games in double game at 25. And so for me, considering the fact that he's not like outrageously attacking and City aren't keeping that many clean sheets, is Gvardiol for even more expensive than the other three? Is he worth it? Probably not for me. So you can see at the moment, whilst these are the four options that I'm considering, for me, it's currently between Branthwaite and Van Heck. And I'm currently leaning Van Heck just because he's playing for a slightly better defense, got slightly better attacking numbers, and he's got slightly better fixtures in the weeks that I need him. But overall... Branthwaite's arguably got better fixtures and I just have this nagging feeling that Branthwaite against Sheffield United at home in 37 could outscore Van Heck given his pretty tricky double. Like, I don't know that I necessarily expect a clean sheet for Van Heck in 37. So let me know down below who you prefer out of the two given my free hit 34 bench boost 37 strategy. 
And that's what the team will look like. So if I just go back to the team now, this is how it looks without any transfers being made. The current plan is to have it exactly as is, with a few benching decisions sorted and with captaincy thought about. Just bring in Van Heck for ourselves and just keep Van Heck on the bench. And then that's it. If I do go for Branthwaite, I have a bit more of a benching headache this week because Everton play against Burnley at home. But I think I would still arguably still have Branthwaite on the bench and just accept that I might get some more bench points. Let me know what you think of the plan down below and let me know what your thoughts are ahead of Game Week 32 too. So guys, this is not a normal sponsored segment, but I have a very exciting announcement for you. I've taken a job as the football manager for South London United, who are part of One Future Football's Global Virtual Football League. One Future Football is a global league run solely by a very advanced AI engine with AI storylines, AI athletes, narratives, and much, much more. And each game is simulated over at One Future Football. You can watch this and you get underlying data for each player and more. It's pretty much like real life, other than the fact that obviously these games aren't actually taking place in real life. Most excitingly, Fans have the ability to actually control how each club and team is developed and also the development of players via training too, which we'll discuss more in the future. Some of these players, by the way, actually have their own social media accounts. So our star player, Ruben Sinclair, who I'll discuss a bit later, has his own Instagram. You can follow him over there too, which I think is pretty cool. So they've essentially created a global super league with 12 clubs from around the world. And for season three of One Future Football, they've decided to hire human managers, which is where I come on board. My club, South London United, is actually owned by Chris Smalling, Jesse Lingard, and Alex Greenwood, which I think is pretty cool. Sadly, we actually finished bottom of the league 12th in season two, so we have a lot of work to do, but it's only up from here. Before I explain further and show you my team selection ahead of round one of season three, because I have made some changes based on what happened last year, I'd love to ask for your support. And this is the key thing that I'm asking you to do today. If you've watched my videos over the years and you've enjoyed them, please do this for me. There is a link down below to sign up to One Future Football. It's completely free to do, will not take a long time. When you sign up, feel free to say that FPL Raptor sent you, as you can see on your screen. But the most important thing, once you've signed up, go into the top right corner of the website and click on dashboard. Once you go onto your dashboard, it will offer you the opportunity to select the club that you would like to support. There will be 12 clubs to choose from, but I do request, maybe even if you're not from the UK, that you just say that you support South London United because that is my team. That is all you have to do, completely free to do. Just say that you support South London United. And when you do that, it will come up saying that you own a certain amount of the club with a certain amount of credits. The more time you spend on One Future Football, the more of your club you own, and therefore the more input you'll be able to have on how the club is run as well. So that is honestly it. All I'm asking you to do is just support South London United, which you can do by heading over to onefuturefootball.com. There is a link down below in the description, going onto dashboard, selecting South London United, and that is it. And then hopefully follow my journey throughout the season and see me take South London United to the top. So with all of that being said, let me now show you the players that I'm dealing with and the formation that I'm setting up for round one. So guys, heading into round one of season three, this is currently the starting 11 that I believe I will select for the game against Paris FC. It is a home game, but just as a bit of context, Paris are one of the best teams in one future football. And when I say one of the best teams, arguably the best team, and therefore we are definitely underdogs. This is like pulling up against Manchester City in game one, and I'm like a newly promoted side. Like We are not expected to win this. However, it is a new season, and this is my first game in charge. So I'm certainly not saying we have no chance. The key change that I've made this season is last year we were playing four at the back and we were fantastic defensively. But the reason we finished bottom is we were basically last on every single metric for attacking football. We had no creativity. We had the lowest amount of shots every game. We just didn't have the chance to score goals. So I think the key way to counter that is to ditch the four at the back and just go for a slightly more attacking formation. And I've tried to select a formation which suits our star players. And the star players really are Adrian Grondon, who is playing right mid. He is comfortably our best attacker. He is getting slightly older. He's approaching 30 now, but he is so fantastic that we need to get him into his favoured position and into those advanced places where he can create. But we've also signed Sabri. Sabri looks basically like a Mohamed Salah region. He's 18 years old, Egyptian, fantastic, very quick and very direct. So the idea here is if we can get Grondon and Sabri into those advanced positions, creating for Sinclair who's our key star striker, and Moyano, who we've signed this season to partner with Sinclair, the four of them should be able to create enough chances. We're going to play a slightly more direct attacking football this year. We're not going to hold off. And I expect there to be lots of goals in our games. If you're going to predict the way this goes, less clean sheets, but hopefully more goals. I think our midfield is still solid enough to still suit this formation with Sakura, Orcock and Obag Bamiro because they are really, really defensively solid players with good physicality. And that three-man defense is very strong. Eke is our captain. He is very, very reliable. Play pretty much every game. Nor is actually a left back, but I've slotted him in at left centre back because he's very 
very tall and very physical. And Tesla, I think, is really suited to that right centre-back position too. Diaby was arguably our best player last season in goal. So when I look at this starting eleven, it is very, very good. I'm very happy with it. I will confidently sit here now and say we will not finish bottom of the league this season. So I'm very excited. Ones to watch is definitely Grondon and Sabri, and I'm expecting Sinclair to have a big season too. And yeah, let me know if you've watched to this point. Are you excited? Are you looking forward to seeing me manage South London United? And also make sure to let me know down below if you do sign up so I can thank you personally. So guys, there you have it. That is my Game Week 32 team selection. So many deadlines in quick succession. But after this, we just have one a week for the remainder of the season. And there's not many game weeks left now for us. So we need to start nailing those captaincy and transfer decisions and making sure we get the most points possible. If you did enjoy today's video, please do smash that like button. Let's aim for 1,500 likes and make sure to subscribe to the channel as well. We are very, very close to 115,000 subscribers. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.